Good morning. I'll try that again. Good morning. How are we all doing today? Good, good. That is certainly an exciting time in the life of our church. Uh, Joel and Mick, I have the deepest love and respect for these two men, so I am certainly excited to see what the Lord will continue to do with them in this church and on the elder team. So um, an exciting day for our church this morning. Well, like Brad said, my name is Josh Jeborowski, and this morning when I came here, I was talking to Rachel and Landon, and I said, I feel a bit like I'm in no man's land on my introduction this morning. Uh, I'm a former employee of the church. I used to actually lead our community group ministry, and then I was an elder for several years here. Uh, I did roll off our elder team on February 1st, so uh, I don't know what my title is today. So uh, I'm here, and I'm, I'm Jaws. I'm super excited uh, to be preaching this morning. So I do want to thank the elder team and Tim. When Tim reached out to me and asked me to do this, um, this is something I really like to do. I love the preparation for it. I love where the Lord leads and takes me the weeks up to it. I'm a little bit anxious on those steps when I walk up, but I certainly love the process of getting here and talking with you all this morning. If you are new and visiting our church this week, our lead pastor, Tim Holly, is on sabbatical. He is out for uh, June and July, and he'll be back on August 1st. And I know that's one of the criteria that many of you have if you're searching for a church. You want to meet the lead pastor. You want to meet them. You want to hear them teach. You want to see what they're all about. And I can say that this room is certainly excited about what Tim is doing here and his leadership, and we're glad that he gets some rest. So I want to encourage you to come back, and in the next two months, you're going to hear from several different leaders at our church. So I think it's a great time, actually, if you're checking out our church, to maybe see from some of the different leaders that are here, and they're going to come and talk and teach with us on a Sunday morning. For those of you that have been here for several years, I just want to say thanks. The Lord is stirring, moving, working in the life of this church, and it's a testament to many of you that have stepped in, hopped in, and began to serve uh, and follow his call for your life at this specific local church. And those of you veterans, the five, the 10, the 15 year members, I just smile when I see you because on Sunday morning, it's just a great pleasure to see you. And we've been through a lot and it's exciting to be here with you today. So as we get started today, I'm going to ask that you have your Bibles out. I did give uh, Landon last night at about 11 o'clock, I gave him an outline uh, that was uh, not a great outline. It just was on a, a Google Doc and he turned it into this. So Landon did that in just a few hours. I'm thankful for his creativity. That is not my forte, but we're going to work with this today as we get started. This past year, I was listening to a podcast uh, from a professor at Yale, and she was starting a new class. They were going to offer a new class at the university, and the title of the class was called Psychology of the Good Life. And the entire class is devoted to teaching students to be happier or how to be happy. And when I started the podcast, I had to rewind that several times because I wanted to make sure I had the title of the class correct and the point of the class correct. It's psychology of the good life, and we're teaching students how to be happier. And what resonated with me about that is students that are at Yale, um, there's a little over 6,000 in their undergraduate population. The first semester that this course was offered, a 1,000 students signed up for the class. That's the first semester, and there's only about 6,000 undergraduates at Yale University. What struck me about that is students that are actually admitted to Yale University, they actually have a front row seat to what the world deems as some of the best and highest academic resources and experiences. In fact, many of you I see today are probably getting ready to fill out college applications. And if you are, what you know is you don't show up your junior or senior year in high school and say, I think I'm going to go ahead and throw my hat in the ring and apply to Yale University, right? You don't do that. What you do is you start back in fourth, fifth grade, and what you begin to do is you work on your academic profile up until high school. You set yourself on a track so that when you get to high school, you can take every single AP class that they offer in the highest academic rigor so your application is ready for Yale. Not only do you need to do that, you probably need to play a sport, you need to play an instrument, you need to volunteer, you need to join 35 clubs, and you probably need to start a nonprofit. And, <laughs> and that is all just to make your application competitive. This past year, there's eight Ivy League schools. They received over 400,000 applications. 
their emit rate was under 5%. What that means is that 385,000 students were denied their application to an Ivy League school. So that's why this podcast resonated with me. I would have thought that students, 18, 19-year-old students that achieved a lifelong goal, something that started earlier in their life, they achieved it once they got there, they would certainly not need a class that would teach them how to be happy. And if we have any Yale alums, I'm sorry I'm picking on Yale today, but what I would say is that I think if all of us would reflect on a long-term goal or accomplishment we had in our life, something that we put a lot of time and energy into, something that when we were working on that long-term goal, that little voice in our head kept saying, when I get there, when I accomplish this, when I achieve this, then I'm going to have that happiness, then I'm going to have that contentment. But once the newness, right, once the newness of that accomplishment or that achievement, once that wears off, all of a sudden the happiness and contentment that that goal promised didn't actually deliver. I think it's the ironic thing about achievement and accumulation is that most of the time when we get there, we're wanting more. When your sports team wins the title, the first words out of everybody's mouth are, well, now let's repeat. You want to do it again. You crave more. When our needs, and specifically when our wants are met, it leaves us wanting more. And today what we are in is we are in a five-part series. So this is the third week that we're in this. And we're in Matthew 6, and we're looking at the Lord's Prayer. And today the verse that we're looking at is Matthew 6.11. And it says on the front of your outline there, it says, give us this day our daily bread. And so what we're talking, the heart of what we're talking about today is contentment. And if our hearts are content, how do we take that? And how does that lead us into prayers of contentment? And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to look at three different passages so I'm going to challenge you this morning to, to keep your Bible open and on your lap. I've got about 30 verses we're going to work through. And I'm already seeing some head drops, heads drop because like it's going to rain and you've got steaks to put on the grill for Father's Day. But I'm going to try to keep us within the sermon limit this morning. I want to look at three different passages. And if you look at your outline, there's the answer key right there. We're going to start back in the book of Exodus and then we're going to move to the book of Ecclesiastes. And what I want to do in both of those passages is I want us to begin to see what can keep us from having a content heart. What can keep us from going to the Lord and praying prayers of contentment? And then we're going to finish the sermon today in Matthew 26, where we should finish every sermon. We're going to look at the life of Jesus, and we're going to see how Jesus was led into praying prayers of contentment. So if you have your Bibles, if you would, uh, if you'd open to Exodus 16, we're going to look at verses 13 through 21. If you're using one of the black Bibles in the pews, it's on page 58. And what I want to do today is I want to kind of do a zoom in and a zoom out. I want to provide some context and some background for each one of these passages that we're going to look at. But then, then once we have that content, content and context, what I want to do is then I want us to look at some specific verses, some specific phrases, and maybe the Lord is pressing in on us. So before we start reading that passage, let me pray, and we'll get started this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the preservation of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you can allow us to read this today, what was written thousands of years ago. We can look and see that your character has not changed from then until today. And we can see that it is a truth, Lord, that is timeless. And Father, it's something that we need this morning. So I pray that as we all enter into your word this morning, that we would not lean back, Father, but that we would be attentive and that you would use the Holy Spirit to illuminate our hearts and our minds to what you're teaching us in your word today. And Father, we pray that humbly, but we pray it extremely confidently because we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, prior to chapter 16, if you go back and you look at Exodus 12, what's happening is the Israelites have been uh, under the heavy hand of the Egyptians for over 400 years. And the Lord is bringing the 10th plague. He strikes down the firstborn. He goes through all of Egypt and he strikes down the firstborn. He passes over the houses of the Israelites. 
When Pharaoh hears that, what Pharaoh says is, Pharaoh says, go, people go. Israelites, take your stuff and leave. I don't want any more plagues. And then what we see in chapter 13 is the Lord instructs the Israelites. He says, you know what you need to do? You need to remember this. And you need to pass this on from generation to generation of how the Lord has provided for you at this time. You get to chapter 14, and what happens is Pharaoh changes his mind. He says, well, hang on a sec. I lost all my labor. I need to go out and get them. And so what what begins to happen is the Israelites are out. The Egyptian army begins to follow them. And what the Israelites are looking at is they're looking at the Red Sea in front of them, and they're looking at the uh, Egyptian army behind them. The Lord parts the Red Sea. The Israelites walk through. When the Egyptian army comes in, it collapses, and Scripture says not one of them was left. When you get into chapter 15, this is literally three days after they've witnessed the parting of the Red Sea, you begin to see the grumbling. And the grumbling from the Israelites starts, it's about water and food. It leaks into the front part of chapter 16. And what's ironic about that is he has just shown them who he is and what he can do, and yet three days later, the grumbling starts. And so when we pick up in verse 13 here, as we read these verses, what you're going to see is the Lord is showing the Israelites, hey, you're you're out of the heavy hand of Egypt. Now today, this is how I'm going to provide for you. You're grumbling for food and water. This is what I'm going to give you. So let's start in verse 13. It says, in the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing fine as frost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. We are talking about give us this day our daily bread. This is what the Lord has commanded. He said, gather of it, each one of you, as much as you can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. So the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. And whoever gathered little had no lack. I love that verse. Whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till the morning. Verse 20 is the pivotal verse because it starts with the word, but, but they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning and it bred worms and stank and Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, eat as much as they could eat, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. And so what you see throughout these verses is the Lord was providing for them. The Lord was giving them the food, the water, all the provision that they needed for their day, but yet it wasn't enough. Verse 20 says, we're not going to do exactly what you instructed me to do. I think there's two things that the Israelites are displaying here, and I think there are two things in our life that keep us from having a content heart. And the first is a hurried mindset. The Israelites were unable to rest in and be present in the moment. Instead, their minds were hurried in getting more than they needed or more than God had instructed them to get. And a hurried mindset caused them, as much as it causes us, to look past our needs, and it breeds discontentment. A couple weeks ago, uh, I was getting a coffee at Breadco, and I go to Breadco each morning. I'm, I'm cheap, and I'm part of that coffee club where I can go in and fill my mug up on the way to, on the way to work. And what I will say is my main goal my main goal of that part of my day is to get into Breadco as quick as I can and get out. There's a kiosk there, the coffee's in the front. I can just go in and I, I'm hoping the kiosk works and I'm hoping that the dark roast is full. And if that's good, I can get out of Breadco fairly quickly. Well, a couple of weeks ago I was in there and how our Breadco is situated is there's, there's actually, a, the counter is behind it so you can get in literally with talking to nobody. And I'm sitting there and I'm filling up my coffee and I hear a voice from behind the counter that says, oh, hi there. And and I look up and she says, hi, my name's Tracy. And she comes around the front and she says, I see you here every day. 
And Martha's like, oh, great. Like, I, I haven't said hi to her. Like, I'm feeling really bad about myself at this point. And she comes out, and she just has this conversation with me. She starts telling me, hey, are you part of our coffee club? Like, you know, if you pay yearly, it's cheaper. Which, okay, I'm listening now. Like, this is a, this is a good deal. <laughs> All right? And so she has this conversation with me. And I left there that morning, and what it showed me, what it revealed in my life, will Tracy and I ever be in the same community group? Will we ever really be friends? I I doubt it. I, I don't think that that's what the Lord was doing with my time in that morning. But what I will say is he opened my eyes to what the rest of my day looks like. And because I couldn't wait to get to the next thing. My main goal was to get out early so I had 10 extra minutes in my office in the morning. And what it began to do is it began for me to to evaluate and look at my day. I struggle greatly with hurry. I have an extremely hurried mindset. I'm not present at every point in the day. And I think what God was showing me at that point and what he was speaking to the Israelites in this passage is that throughout your day, you have minutes to take a step back. You have time to engage and be present in the moment. The Lord is providing something for you in that day. It sounds very mundane that it was a conversation with an employee at Breadco. But the reality is that she had probably been there 4.35 in the morning, and I was rushing to get out. But yet it stopped me, and it slowed me, and it taught me, what do I need to know for the rest of this day? The second thing that I think we see the Israelites struggling with, and I think we struggle with it as well, is what I would call a hoarding mindset. And when most of us hear that word hoarding, what we automatically think about is you think about the reality TV show when they open the garage and it's packed, oh, those closets are full, well, that basement's pretty full. And some of you are saying, well, this is not me. This is not, I, my, garage is, my garage looks great, okay? This is, I, I don't have any issues with hoarding anything. But what I would say is I think hoarding is actually, it's very sneaky how it creeps into our mind and into our hearts. And a couple weeks ago, I was reading an article and it said Bill Gates was, he was giving a commencement speech at a college. And what he was focused on, what the, what the point of his speech was, is if Bill Gates could go back and if he could talk to his, give some advice to his 20, himself as a 20-year-old, what would I tell myself as a 20-year-old? That's what he was, kind of the, the point of his speech. And what he says in the speech here, um, Bill Gates says he wishes his younger self knew there was more to life than work. In my early 20s, I did not believe in weekends or vacations. I pushed around, I pushed around all to work long, very, to work long hours, referring to his early days in Microsoft. He expected the same work ethic from his employees and said that he used to take notes of which of his employees were working the longest hours daily and which ones left early. Now, Bill Gates is worth about $115 billion. He's in the top five richest men on the planet, okay? So, like, part of this is like the whole hindsight's 2020 thing, right? Like, like Bill, that's easy to say now. Like, the mission's accomplished. Like, you've got your $100 billion, so it's really easy for you to look back and say, I probably didn't need to have that mindset. But what Bill Gates was doing in that part in his life, and it's something that I think many of us that I do, is he was not trusting what could happen in the future there. Do we trust what God is going to do tomorrow? So he was sacrificing the good of his employees, the good of his weekends, the good of his vacations, because he was trying to dictate and control what would happen down the road. And as Christians, I think what God is showing us and what he's showing us in the story of the Israelites is we don't need to hoard more. Not necessarily what's in your garage, but what's in your heart and your mind. What are you hoarding in your heart and your mind that you are not trusting and I am not trusting God with down the road? I think both of these things, hurry and hoarding, are done when we are not content. So when we have a hurried and hoarding mindset, that leaks into our prayer life and it keeps us from praying contending prayers. I'm going to have a challenge for you today at each one of my stops, and this is the first stop. Some of you are like, whoa, 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 back, bro, back it up. I'm not applying to Yale. I don't, I don't need homework today, okay? I'm going to give you three things to take this week, and this is what I'm going to say. We, we come to church 52 times a year, right? We hear 52 sermons. Maybe you miss a few for vacation or use sports, but we're here almost every week. 
And what do we do with that sermon when we leave here? How do we process it? Do we leave? Is it something that we take and it pivots our week? So I'm going to challenge you this week to go back and read Exodus 12 through 16, maybe even go through 18 and read that. I think it's one of the most tangible pieces of scripture that shows us the Lord's daily provision in our lives. And I think when you do that, it it helped me this month organize and orient my mind to hurrying and hoarding. The second thing that I believe that can keep us from praying prayers of contentment is an unsatisfied mindset. I'm going to ask you to go right in your Bible a little bit. And I'm going to ask you to go to the book of Ecclesiastes, which is on, I think if you have one of our black Bibles, it's page 553. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes too. So if you're opening your Bible, you've got Psalms, you've got Proverbs. Psalms is kind of in the middle of the Bible. If you go right a little bit, you're going to see Proverbs. And then Ecclesiastes is going to be right after that. And we're going to look at 11 verses. We're going to start in chapter, or we're going to stay in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to ask you to hang with me for a minute here because I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of plow through these verses one by one and I want to give a little bit of a, a piece for each one of these verses. But King Solomon, if you want to read about the life of King Solomon, you can go back to 1 Kings chapter, I think it's chapter 3 through 11 and you can read about the life of King Solomon. And what King Solomon is talking about, he's reflecting on some of the things that he's accomplished or had in his life in the book of Ecclesiastes. And so he, he starts in verse, chapter 2, verse 1. He says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. What he means is he's going to start to unpack some of the things that he's tested his heart with for pleasure. Enjoy yourself. He says, but behold, this was also vanity. Now the word vanity pops up a lot in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a notoriously hard word to translate. But what it essentially means is it means like a vapor or it's fleeting, something that's not going to quench, something that's not going to hang around. That's what the word vanity means. What Solomon's going to do in the next nine verses or so, two through ten, he's going to point out some very specific things. When we get down to verse 11, he's going to end in the same place that he started. So this is what he says in verse 2. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? And most of us think, when Psalm is talking about laughter, most of us think when we're laughing, we have joy. That's a fun activity. That's a fun experience. That's something in our lives that we're actually enjoying. We're content. Solomon's saying, not so. Laughter couldn't even quench that. He says in verse 3, I searched my heart to how to cheer my body with wine. My heart's still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for my children for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Solomon's talking about alcohol here. He's talking about drinking. And what he's saying is that, and that's something that our culture really lifts up, like, like, hey, it's not really an event, and it's not really a party, and it's not really a good thing until the alcohol shows up. It's like I, like I watch some of these, these sports teams that have won the championships, and they have the parade, and the parade's great, but what's going on at the parade? Like, everybody's dumping alcohol on one another. And it's like, okay, now it's really a party. The alcohol's here. What Solomon's saying, I've experienced that. Many of us in this room, we know there's a backside to that, right? Like, that's not so, that's not so life-giving the next day. We know that. And that's what Solomon is saying in verse 3. He moves on to verse 4. He says, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which... Which to, the water forest, which to water the forest of growing trees. In verses 4 through 6, Solomon's talking about real estate here. If you go back and read 1 Kings, it says Solomon took seven years. He took seven years to build the temple, but yet he took 13 years to build his house. Solomon accessed to 20, 30,000 laborers to build what he needed. And what he's saying is it's not enough. I think a lot of us would say, gosh, if my house was just a little bit bigger, right? If it was a little bigger, then I I would have a little bit more contentment, a little bit more satisfaction. Solomon's saying, not so. He moves into verse 7. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold 
and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. Solomon's talking about money and possessions here. If you go back and look in 1 Kings, there's people that brought Solomon thousands, thousands of pounds of gold each year. He had a gift of 9,000 pounds. He'd get 20 to 20,000 pounds of gold a year. People would give it to him. In fact, in 1 Kings 10, 27, it says when the silver came, they just set it over there. Like, hey, so we don't even need the silver. My, my forks are gold. My cups are gold. My plates are gold. Like, oh, we don't even use the silver here. That's how much money Solomon had. Would it be nice if you weren't on a budget? Yeah. My AC went out this week. Wish I wasn't on a budget. All right? Solomon is saying that will not even quench what you're looking at. Verse 9, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. If you go back and read 1 Kings, why this verse is so pivotal, people came from all over the earth to hear from Solomon. They wanted to hear his wisdom. Now, I don't know about you, but it's great to have the answer. Like when my kids ask me a question, I want to have the answer. And one of the most deflating things is when my kids ask me a question and I pause for a little bit, and then they, they, they use the phrase, Dad, I guess you better search that up, right? Like, you better go to Google. And that's what they tell me. That's how they tell me to search it up. I go to Google and search that up. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. So it, it's, you kind of got to walk that back. Okay, you know, swallow your pride and you search it up. It's good to know the answer at work, right? Like, you want to be a colleague that comes with solutions. You don't want to be the colleague. You want to be the colleague that can say something, do something. Solomon had that kind of fame and education, and he's saying, no, it's not even enough. I'm, there is still discontentment. It's a vapor. It's fleeting. And just for good measure, if I read those verses and you're like, yeah, none of that applies to me, uh, he throws in verse 10. And what he says in verse 10, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for my toil. Solomon's saying that I've seen it all, I've had it all, and it's fleeting. And this is where he ends in verse 11. It's, it's one of my favorite verses. He says, Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil that I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity, and striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. We read that, and first off, thanks for sticking with me because that was a lot of talking in five minutes on 11 verses. But the reason I did it that way and the reason I spoke it that way is because I wanted you to match thing after thing after thing next to each other and see that it really doesn't provide, it really doesn't provide a satisfied mindset. The bottom line is we want more time, we want more stuff, we want more money, we want more designer gear, we want more technology, we want more vacations, more accomplishments, we want more compliments. And I think what you'll find out is the older that you get, you begin to see that like I've already been around the cul-de-sac a few times, like I've already tried that, and my mind reverts back to saying, hmm, I, I think I wanted that, but then I got that, well, let me just try it again, and you go around the cul-de-sac again. The point kind of goes back to where I started with that story of the students from Yale this morning, right? Like, when you want something and you get it, it, le it usually leaves us wanting more. This past semester, my sixth grade son, Asher, uh, has been studying World War II. And so it, it's, actually been, it's actually been really fun to kind of talk with him about that point in history. And um, one of the things that they, they've really been talking about is the Holocaust and then the story of Anne Frank. And so my wife uh, bought the, Amanda bought the, the Diary of Anne Frank, and we were looking at it the last couple of weeks. And this is what she says. This is one of her uh, diary, I guess, inserts. It was on Sunday, May 2nd, 1943. Now, Anne Frank is 13 years old, and her family is basically in an attic. They're told to stay in an attic. They can't be loud. Somebody has to bring them food, medicine, everything. And it, it, the stakes are high, right? Like, if somebody hears them or sees them, well, not only will they be most likely be separated from their family, but they're probably looking at torture or death at that point in their lives. This is a 13-year-old girl. And this is what she says. 
When I think about our lives here, she's talking about in the attic. I usually come to the conclusion that we live in a paradise compared to the Jews who aren't in hiding. All the same, later on, when everything returns to normal, I'll probably wonder how we, who always lived in such comfortable circumstances, could have sunk so low. So when I hear that, when I hear that insert from the diary of Anne Frank, and I compare it with what Solomon is saying in chapter 2, we really don't need more stuff. This really is not about stuff. Our unsatisfied mindset gravitates to that, but that's not really what it's about. And some of us think that, well, if I had Solomon's level of stuff, Josh, seriously, if I had that kind of money, I'd be satisfied. And what I would challenge you in that is we live in a very a very comfortable time in terms of the people in this room. If you look outside, if you look at history or outside of this country, there's people that don't live as comfort levels as high as we do. And in fact, you can read article after article. What it says is that our quality of life is higher, but our contentment in life is lower. And what I want to clarify here, because I, I, when I say that, what I think some of our minds can skew to is like, well, so what are you saying, Josh? Like, I'm supposed to go home, empty my house, take it to Savers, and I'm supposed to cancel my vacations, and then all of a sudden I'm going to be content. And what I want to say as Christians, I think we rest in between two things. We rest in between something called a poverty theology, where they say, hey, if I sell everything and don't have anything, and if I'm poor, then I'm going to have joy, and then I have this, this righteous life with God. And then you can also guard against the prosperity theology, Right? That says, hey, if I pray hard enough, right enough, if I have the right faith, God's going to bless me with health, wealth, and power. And somewhere in the middle there, it falls in the middle. You can look throughout the Bible, and there's rich people that are happy, and rich people that have joy. There's poor people that have joy. There's rich people that are miserable, and there's poor people that are miserable. So what we, uh, what we pull from this passage with Solomon is it's, it's a point on the back of your sheet there. And what, it's, what I want to get to, what I'm trying to say is that God is ask, asking us to rightly steward and prioritize his provision in our lives. And so we examine that when we read the book of Ecclesiastes. Here's your second challenge. If you don't have a Bible study this summer, I would really challenge you to study the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I, I don't ever say that there's a favorite book I have in the Bible, but I will say I've come back to this book multiple times, and I would say it challenges me every single time. I was asking Stephen Hess because I had a pastor tell me one time that there's the least amount of commentaries written on the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, I don't know how he measured that. I don't know if he went to Amazon and, and searched up all the commentaries. But the point is this, is that I think it's, it's a hard book to process. And so what I would say, what I do when I'm studying that book is I, I have the ESV study Bible, and I read a chapter at a time. And I read the chapter, and I process it, and then I go down low, and I read the notes in the ESV study Bible to help with some content and some theology. So you can go this summer, and you can read 1 Kings 3 through 11. You can read about the life of Solomon, and then you go and you read the book of Ecclesiastes. It will challenge you at a lot of levels. I know it challenges me in this realm of an unsatisfied mindset. The final thing that we're going to hit on today, and we're going to go right in the Bible again. We're going to go over to Matthew 26, and this is where I want to land today. This is where I want to finish today. If you're using one of our black Bibles, it's on page 832. It's Matthew 26, and we're going to be in verses 36 through 46. Last week in our response time, Greg Murphy, he, he referenced this passage uh, when he was leading us in prayer time last week. Again, it's on page 832. It's Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. And Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here. He asked his disciples, and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he, became, and he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you could now watch with me one hour? 
Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. So he's praying for a second time. He says, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, disciples sleeping again, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to his disciples and he said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going, and see my betrayer. I'm always extremely careful when I get the privilege to to speak on a Sunday morning, because I'm well aware that we all walked in with something today, that we all walked in with something that we're facing in our life that is real, that's emotional, and that's hard. And so I'm not going to, I don't get up here and act like I know exactly what everybody is going through. But what I will say is when I read this passage, I, I see Jesus going through a couple things that are a little bit tough at this point in his life, right? I mean, the first thing that I see is that he has led these disciples for years, and he's getting ready at the culmination of his ministry to, to, to send them out. And he, what does he ask them to do? He asks them to watch and pray, and he finds them sleeping multiple times. I haven't ever seen it in Scripture. I, I don't think Jesus was walking around fully armed. He wasn't walking around with a sword and a shield. You don't necessarily see that here either. Yet he knows there's probably some Roman soldiers coming for him that have some weaponry. And I would say I don't think that the Roman Empire particularly was spreading the message of Jesus, right? The message of Christianity. So he didn't have a political... Uh, His political candidate wasn't in power at this point. And then the thing for me that really resonates is that Jesus was facing the cross at this point. And if you go on and you continue to read in the Gospel of Matthew, what you're going to see is he experiences severe emotional, physical, and spiritual pain. I can get my arms around the first two passages. I can get my arms around the Israelites, the grumbling, the disobedience, to not, because that's me, I get that. That's, I, I, I relate to that 100%. I can get my arms around what Solomon's saying. Hey, the things of this world are fleeting. But when I come into this passage, I can't get my arms around it. I can't get my arms around the work of Christ and what he is getting ready to do for me and for the world. And yet when he prays, he prays it multiple times. He says, Father, your will be done. And so when we talk this morning, when we talk about praying prayers of contentment, I feel this is a passage that would serve us all very well to go back to multiple times. It's your third challenge for the week. Is I would encourage you, maybe for the next 10 days, when you pray, would you look at these 10 verses? Would you read them before you pray or as you start to pray? And then would you say, Lord, give me the mind of Christ. This morning, um, I'm going to call Rachel up. Rachel and the worship team is going to come up. Um, As we finish, I'm going to leave you with a few things, and our response time is a little bit different in these few weeks as, as we're taking some time and some space to pray. But on the back side of your outline, this is the three things that I want to leave you with. And one is to acknowledge and guard against a heart of discontentment. That's why I spent so much time at the early part of this sermon going through that story of the Israelites because I think they had a hurried and a hoarding mindset. And so that would be the first way that I think can lead us into praying prayers of contentment. If you're like me and you struggle with a hurried mindset, I would recommend this book by John Mark Comer called The Elimination, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's a great book. It's it's an easy read. I highly recommend doing that. The second thing that I would say is, do we rightly steward and prioritize God's provision? Like God has met our needs and he's met a lot of our wants. Are we rightly stewarding that and prioritizing what he has given to us? I think that that story in Solomon really helps articulate and illuminate that for us. And the final thing would be is, what is your tangible need for today? And I go back to the simplest of stories that I shared about getting my coffee at Breadco. You know, I prayed that morning. I prayed for my wife. I prayed for my kids. 
prayed for Pastor Tim. But when I got to Breadco, I don't think I actually knew what I needed that morning. And what I needed is I needed God to stop me in my tracks, and he gave me a tangible experience that morning. So as we pray this morning, I want to leave you with those three things.